Greetings. I am Craig Peasley, the composer of Second City Strut, a piece that explores the hybridization between jazz and contemporary concert music. In 2021, Second City Strut won the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra Composition Competition and received its world premiere on October 28th by the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra as part of the annual Contemporary Music Festival held at Indiana State University. Uh, For this festival, I was asked to lead a master class in discussing the nuts and bolts of Second City Strut in more detail, um, highlighting the elements of jazz and modern classical uh, composition, and what makes Second City Strut a distinct work. I will reference the score a little in terms of measure numbers and figures, but the format of this presentation is not ideal for showing a full score in great detail. And for that reason, and if you wish, the link shown on this first page is for a PDF of the full orchestra score. I put this link in the video description below, and also available at that link is an audio sample. To start with, I wanted to touch on what I consider jazz elements uh, that I utilize within Second City Strut, and how I also incorporate classical elements that address similar if not the same parameters. That said, Second City Strut is a jazz composition that happens to fully embrace contemporary classical compositional techniques and also happens to embrace a classical uh, orchestra. We'll look at some in brief here and a little more in depth on some of the others as we progress because I think one element in particular really does an exceptional job of combining classical and jazz worlds and keeping them on equal footing. Now, the first of these parameters is harmonic language. Jazz, of course, utilizes traditional Western harmonies and keys. However, jazz is probably more concerned with the extensions of the chords, the sevenths, ninths, elevenths, thirteenths, so on and so forth. Uh, In the classical world, we call those same extensions tertiary chords, which reminds me of being at a workshop for classical composers, and one individual went and shared a piece of of his uh, for solo piano, and it was a lot of block chords, one after the other. I would call them 13th chords, Uh, classical musicians would call them tertiary chords. Uh, Nonetheless, there were these block chords being pounded out one after the other. There was really no sense of uh, steady rhythm or or a groove behind it. And any other uh, uh, attendees, when the floor opened for feedback, had commented on how, oh, it sounds like jazz. Uh, After a little while, a voice came from the back of the room, my voice saying, that's not jazz. And the reason for it is that jazz, in order to really be jazz, is much more than just an exploration of harmony. Nonetheless, the chordal chords, aside from these chordal extensions, we utilize chordal chords to help create what I call a blue sound um, throughout the, the, the piece. So we see stacked fourths common. Uh, also, inverted and respelled chordal chords contain a lot of seconds in them, so we get a little dissonance, tight uh, harmonic dissonance within these chords that are created. Uh, I also lean heavily on the common uh, six-two-five-one chord progression, in particular in the the full swing part. Now, these jazz harmonic language are augmented by classical elements in which incidental harmonies are created from the web of lines occurring in the what I call the strut theme. And we will talk in great detail about the strut theme later. Uh, sound masses 
these cluster chords using utilizing uh, sometimes microtones at quarter step intervals. Um, these are commonly found the way I use them in uh, sustained chords, usually found in the uppermost registers. Uh, and this I kind of took from the language of uh, Penderecki or Xenakis. The rhythmic language that I made use of as what I considered a jazz element was having a good swing rhythm going along. And also an established groove. I wanted the piece to kind of, well, strut, move around, have it, have it see, sound like it's, uh, it's walking somewhere, so there was a steadiness to it. And, of course, these uh, swing rhythms are kind of accented through uh, syncopation. In the classical uh, realm of rhythmic language that I utilized, specifically were gestural rhythms, uh, which were created through having multiple different tuplets being performed simultaneously. So there would be straight sixteenths combined with triplets, combined with quintuplets, and septuplets, and so on and so forth. And what I label as these uh, gestural rhythms and figures are the sound created by the collective ensemble. So you have all these different rhythmic figures occurring at once and, and nothing really lines up in a single moment until they reach that final note, if that's where it was leading. So ultimately, we find the sound having a specific motion and destination to it, a low to high register, a high to low register, soft to loud, loud to soft, low and soft to high and loud. The <laughs> options are really limitless. And... These are certainly not a sustained harmonic mass of sound like the quarter step cluster chords that I spoke of earlier, but a mass of sound in motion. A sample of one such moment begins on measure 571 and goes to rehearsal marker double H. Now the final jazz element I'm highlighting here is the walking bass line, which is augmented through imitative counterpoint essentially creating this a walking wall of sound and there will be much more on this later but it's kind of important too to, to look at and say it's like oh it, it, it's inter Im, imitative counterpoint in that even when we're making new music today we are looking on things that have existed and occurred in the past and a lot of people think counterpoint the first name that comes to mind is Bach. So even in making music today, we are taking things from 300 years ago. The earliest stages of Second City Strut began in the summer of 2019, while in attendance at a summer composition uh, workshop, camp, program, whatever we want to call it. Um, over the entire two-week retreat, the one presentation that stood out for me was conducted by James Aikman. And of his several workshop prompts uh, for the attendees, I was geared towards the one shown here, his uh, violin concerto lines in motion. That's the first movement. <laughs>
So Aikman shared that same section. And then to describe the technique that he was utilizing was also this workshop prompt, which we see written here for us to go and create a section of non-literal counterpoint in constant similar rhythmic motion. Within modes are created scales so that incidental harmonies are created as a layer upon which to solo. Now, out of that whole phrase, the one part that stood out to me, I'm going to highlight it here, was the constant similar rhythmic motion, which seemed uh, to me to describe a walking bass line. So if we think of a uh, jazz ensemble playing, the bass player is typically playing a walking bass line in which we have these uh, steady quarter notes pulsing along, giving us, or the rest of the ensemble, a sense of, okay, where the rhythm and tempo lay, and then the rest of the ensemble then are improvising to that. I imagined what numerous walking bass lines would sound when they're just piled one on top of another. And so I built things from the bottom up, whereas Aikman starts in the upper voices and goes from there. So after Aikman gave his demonstration and all of us attendees went off to our you know, various corners to create something based on one of his ideas, here is my initial effort. Liking what I had and needing to create a larger work, I sketched out a little road map of where those 70 measures were taking me. Uh, yeah, I needed to create a larger work because I was entering my final semester for a master's degree at Northern Illinois University and needed something for a final grand thesis project in order to graduate. So we take a look at this we see that I have these just various, it, it's a drawing that made sense to me. I have various little shapes here and shadings to say, okay, I, j just to kind of give me an idea of what the scope of the sound was going to be. Uh, as I marked on here too, I have this strut theme. We can see that it grows from a small portion to something very large, a bunch of these vertical lines stating that we have these interruptions and I have this cluster chord cloud on top the principal theme occurring and the piece moves forward until the end and so when I, I, I certainly advise everyone who's going to be writing music to sketch their ideas out in any way they see fit 
all it has to do is make sense to you because you are the one who is ultimately writing, composing, orchestrating the work. The strut theme. It's what makes Second City strut, well, strut. Um, it's created through that counterpoint and constant similar rhythmic motion. Predominantly, we hear it in pizzicato strings. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I conceptually had it as that being a walking bass line that becomes or turns into a walking wall of sound. Now, all of the string sections, when it is in the strings, are in divisi. So we first hear it in contrabass A, as shown below here, in measures 32 through 35. And from this new scale that I created, F, G sharp, A, B, C, D sharp, E, uh, this recurring pattern occurs that is continually transposed. And that pattern from this bizarre mode, this, this cycle, uh, runs root, fifth, fourth, second, third, sixth, seventh. And that's the first half. And that then that seventh acts as a leading tone, bringing us back to the root, in this case, as we see, F. Fifth, fourth, sixth, third, seventh, second. And that second acts as a new leading tone to a new root and a, a new uh, recurrence of the pattern. Looking at measures 70 through 81 here, uh, we have all of the string parts in Divisi, which gives us 10 independent lines occurring in simultaneity. And here are all of the roots, or uh, new beginnings, to the cycle. What I found is that this created a mass of sound with uniform timbral quality, which I then used as a foundation, you know, harmonic, rhythmic, even melodic, that basically turns into a background percussive part over which I could put anything. You know, I could put a principal melody or just chords on top of this. And it did not matter what the key was, the mode, the harmonies, the harmonic function, whatever, of this foreground material. So I've isolated the string section to help highlight what is happening in this section starting at measure 32. We hear the strut theme moving along in one voice, then another, and another as each one um, enters. And if we really focus hard, we can pull out that, that melodic cycle in each new voice. variations on the strut theme. Well, first of all, we have these interruptions, which I kind of uh, alluded to earlier as being gestural rhythm, rhythmic figures. So in measures 107 through 108, here's a sample of an interruption. <laughs> Another variation would be moving from that highly active gestural figure that just interrupts the flow of everything that happens and into the established swing groove. So what we hear is that after this gestural figure occurs, everybody in the band kind of gets, they lose their, they lose their place and they got to find, find that groove back.
So when these various uh, uh, members of the ensemble are trying to find their groove, I kind of affectionately call that part of the, the strut theme, the, the popcorn idea, because everything's happening at all beats. Uh, so we can go from that swing groove then into this popcorn theme. So the, the ensemble kind of loses up, they lose the groove on their own. Uh, they don't need this gestural figure to throw them off kilter. So in this section, measures 169 to 240, it begins with the harp at rehearsal marker J. <laughs> Another way to vary the idea of the strut theme was just to change the timbre. So I stuck it in the woodwinds. And I first of all have it as starting on the beat, as can be seen at marker, rehearsal marker N. <laughs> Also had it, as can be seen at rehearsal marker double D, off the beat. Another variation was to have t both timbral and registral displacements. So it would be on one instrument very low, then on a completely different instrument very high, and so on and so forth. So he's starting here at this section, uh, beginning at measure 420, starts with a trombone. Then it goes to a flute after that. And ultimately this section ends with the harp and piano at measure 428, before settling back into the strings on pizzicato. <laughs> The various thematic material found in Second City Strut, there's a principal melody, these responding chordal themes, uh, and they're responding to that principal melody, so you could consider this as a secondary kind of melody. Uh, the sound mass ideas, which we showed... Uh, described earlier. The gestural figures, again, described earlier. And there's this section that I just call the swing band theme. And then, of course, the strut theme that really churns throughout the whole work. So first, looking at the swing band theme, uh, what I initially did was sketch out uh, an idea of what would happen in the section, and then took liberties from the sketch when arranging it for the full orchestra. So here we see a more or less lead sheet. We have the chords, the melodic content, and here's what it ended up being and sounding like when arranged for the full orchestra.
gestural figures. Uh, these were interspersed throughout the work, interrupting the established groove and, as I mentioned earlier, causing things to kind of go off the rails. Uh, the band would be, be off kilter for a few moments thereafter. So here are two gestural samples. <laughs> melody and uh, as I described earlier it's a secondary theme this responding uh, chordal ideas uh, it really helped to establish a syncopated swing feel by accenting the and of the beats the accent off beats the accent on the beat and really keep things uh, you as a listener kind of guessing well, where is this kind of happening or what's going to happen next so the sample that I'm going to share now begins on measure 122, and I've isolated as much as I can uh, the brass in this section because the brass are doing both of the uh, principal melody and these responding chords. cluster chords constructed commonly from quarter step uh, pitches but always at least half step intervals and almost always placed in the the uppermost reaches uh, high woodwinds flutes oboes and clarinets that we see here as well as the shoulder strings and other moments uh, meaning the violins and the violas so again looking at the sample starting at measure 122 and I've isolated here the woodwinds so we can listen to these really tight harmonies and how they just kind of sustain and individually they don't really do anything but when combined with the rest of the uh, ensemble then some interesting stuff happens course now the strut theme as discussed earlier it helps establish uh, the groove tempo and once more looking at this sample beginning on measure 122 and I've isolated the strings as much as I can and we'll take a listen to that <laughs> Thank you. 
so throughout the work, you can argue that there are uh, what the, these four themes that generally are occurring at the same time, that there is a hierarchy to them, with the principal melodic themes being in the foreground, with the secondary uh, harmonic melodic uh, themes, those chordal chords and harmonies that are utilized as a response to the principal themes being in the foreground as well, but a, t- a hair behind the, the principal um, m- melodies. And then in the background, we certainly have those incidental harmonies those fr- from, the, from the strut theme that are created and those sound masses also occurring certainly in the background to my ear sometimes those are the furthest in the background and then at other moments they're in front of the strut theme and so effectively all of these ideas happening at the same time create a massive sound in the top with the sound masses and another massive sound in the low end kind of in the strut theme i say kind of because predominantly it started off with these or what we hear most are the, are the the low end, the floor strings, the the basses and the cellos. And between these two things, they lay this foundation for the foreground materials, the principal melodies and those responding melodic ideas. So, as I mentioned earlier, all of those other uh, samples started on measure 122, and I isolated those. Now, if we take all of these elements and combine them together, here it is. interesting challenges uh, in creating Second City Strut was how to get a classical orchestra to swing. And swing is perhaps the most difficult thing to define within jazz music, but it also is arguably the quintessential element of jazz music. So in order to get that orchestra to swing, I predominantly wrote the piece in a 6-8 meter in order to have this built-in swing lilt and making things a bit easier for the performers to swing. And of course, the strut theme firmly establishes a rhythmic groove. The rhythmic accentuations and the melodic ideas add syncopation. And those are kind of those chief elements as to how to get the, the orchestra to swing. And then all of a sudden we have these flurries of activity interrupting this established groove in these various ways. As I mentioned earlier, low to high, high to low, soft to loud, loud to soft, so on and so forth. And then, of course, we have a full-fledged section to have the orchestra sound as though it was a swing band. Hey, it's 1941 all over again. And a lot of these rhythmic elements and materials go into the form of the piece. Uh, Initially, what I kind of imagined the piece being was a band at a rehearsal, struggling, succeeding, and then going off the rails. So initially... The swing beat is set up by the orchestra struggling to find the groove.
after the band finds the groove, eventually the groove is broken up by the flurries of high activity in those gestural rhythms that we spoke of earlier. After getting sidetracked several times from these gestural rhythms and figures and and various other ways to help vary the materials, the band finally gets their act together and is in full swing. So I kind of imagined uh, listeners, the audience being, it's like, wow, this band is terrible. They can't play anything. And then eventually when that finally gets to that full swing section, the members of the audience be going, hey, these guys are all right. Wow, they can really swing. This sounds spectacular. <laughs> After the full swing band section, the band goes off the rails. And in here we have all of the thematic elements that I uh, went through earlier are occurring at the same time. So we have the swing groove, the sound masses, the gestural figures, the principal themes, the strut theme, everything. And each one gets highlighted for a moment. And this is certainly from uh, Luciano Berio's Sinfonia, the third movement, in which a lot of quotations occur. But throughout that whole movement is Gustav Mahler's second symphony, the third movement of it. So other things would uh, occur that very much take over what's happening. And then we don't hear Mahler at all, or it's just buried in the background. And then other times we hear the Mahler uh, symphony clear as day. And using that as kind of a model, I thought of what it would be like if I took, say, the various uh, themes that are they're all occurring at the same time. What if they're all happening on stage, if this is like a theatrical performance? And the person who was uh, the, the spotlight operator has it highlighted, you know, they're highlighting the principal theme. And then that theme will fade away as the spotlight then moves off of it and onto a different theme, uh, the, the principal theme and the, and the secondary theme with a call and response, and so on and so forth. So in this section, we, we, we find that, and there are moments in which if you listen very carefully, faintly in the background, we can hear the strut theme. But it's buried behind a thick buildup of all of these other ideas occurring at the same time, with at least one really being pushed into the foreground, more so than the rest. <laughs> ends with kind of a cliche, the bassy ending. I will play it here. And we've all, any of us who have listened to jazz over the years, we've heard that ending occur 
an innumerable number of times. It's a, a classic ending. Uh, what I did here is that I utilized those uh, same intervals within these very, very thick chords. So they're buried in there. And then going, instead of having these uh, uh, hits on these chords and then silence, I had these gestural themes going, leading up to these hits or away from them. And then at the very end, this, the, for that last uh, big chord, I had a very large um, cluster chord leading into it. of the audio that you've been hearing is a combination of real musicians on their various instruments. I filled out all of the brass, uh, the flutes and oboes, and then of course virtual instruments uh, controlled by MIDI data. So I had uh, found some volunteer uh, friends to help me out and said, hey, look, this is my project. This is what I want to do. And I wanted to have a, as best an audio quality that I could so that I would be happy to share it at things rather than just saying, hey, look, I didn't, it's never been performed. Uh, here's the MIDI version. And so another thing for all of you composers and arrangers out there, even if you cannot get all of the various parts, feel free to record as much as you can and then combine the, the MIDI data to it. So in here, I had uh, friends and colleagues, classmates, uh, record various parts, and on all of those, uh, shall we say, chaotic, uh, ridiculous, you know, the gestural figures with the insane rhythms to it, I told them, you don't have to worry about that. I will have the MIDI data uh, kind of take over for you in those moments. So this combination between the two did not have a real orchestra, but I was able to create uh, an audio that I was you know, still even more than happy to share with others as a sample of what the work sounds like. I thank you for tuning in, listening, and I hope you enjoyed the well, for lack of a better term, lesson on <laughs> uh, contemporary classical composition combined with jazz. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to leave them here in the comments section on this uh, YouTube video. I'm Hopefully we'll be able to tune in for many, many years to come and be able to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. <laughs>